How do fractional CMOs hit the ground running? I'm Dean Way. Welcome to Fractional CMOs and the 90 Day Win. There's a lot of variety in how they kick off a new client engagement. In fact, there's so much variety, it's valuable to just listen to what opportunities they look for, what they tackle first, and what they wish wasn't true when they started a new project. So let's find out. Beth, let's start with you. Uh, I'm going to ask, I'm going to give you the first question and then introduce yourself either at the beginning or the end of it. It's up to you. Okay. So imagine you just started a new engagement. Hopefully that's not hard to imagine because it's happening for you all the time. You're the fractional CMO. Uh, we'll talk about early wins in a moment, but first, what problems do you typically see or what problems do you normally look for on day one of a new engagement? Okay. Thanks, Dean. Um, yeah. So I'm Beth. Um, I have been a fractional CMO in and out of in-house and uh, consulting engagements for the last 10 years or so. And I mostly work with B2B SaaS companies. Okay. So what, <laughs> what I see most often uh, at the beginning of an engagement would be a misalignment of a product market fit um, inside of the leadership team. So what the leadership team has envisioned as product market fit is often not what actually can be their mar product market fit. Does it make sense? Um, no. <laughs> okay. So I come in as a CMO, fractional, mm -hmm. and I need to be building growth strategies. Most of the time I'm coming in often with a startup who has hit a stagnant growth stage. So they've kind of gone through this funder growth and now they're like, hey, wait a minute, we're not scaling at the rate right. that we need to be for ourselves, okay. for investors and so forth. And so are we selling the right value to the right audience to hit a repeatable, scalable growth? And often what the leadership team or even amongst themselves, there might not be alignment. What they feel that is, is often not in fact what it needs to be to scale. Right. That's okay. Fair. Gotcha. Of course, I understood it. I was simply saying no in case someone in the audience did that. Of course. Like, I'm, all, I'm all over that. All right. <laughs> hey, Trevor, how about you? What, what, what problems do you normally see or what do you normally look for? And tell the audience who you are. Sure. Thanks so much, Dean. And nice to meet you as well, Beth, for just meeting for the first time. Same. Um, so, so I'm Trevor Turnbull. And I have been operating in marketing and sales roles for the better part of 20 years, but really started positioning myself fractionally within the last like two years, I would say, but operating that way for the last 10. And what I mean by that is that typically the kind of clients that I work with, they're visionary entrepreneurs. So they've usually had a big, crazy idea when they first started out and they made it come true to a certain level. And that's got them so far. And now they want to get to the next level and they just can't do it on their own. So right. the most important thing that I focus on when I'm first engaging with somebody like that is to understand the big crazy idea. Because typically the weeds that they're caught in in the current moments are not actually aligned with that big vision. They're just caught up in the day to day. So unless I can understand what that vision is, it's impossible to actually recommend a strategy. Okay. So then let's, Trevor, let's just keep going. So what kind of early wins or low hanging fruit do you like to do in the first 90 days? Yeah, well, there's always something that's uh, not being looked at close enough because that's just the nature of the marketing world. Right. There's plenty of opportunities everywhere, whether it's in the email list or whether it's in personal connections in the LinkedIn network, whether it's in the offer, the model. Um, and of course, the gaps that might exist within the team too, where that founder is maybe too much into one particular area because they're really good at it, but they need to figure out how to remove themselves. So the quick win stuff is to just find the greatest pain that a lot of right. times the visionary entrepreneur can't even see. And it can be a variety of different things at the start. And how about you, Beth? What kind of early wins or low-hanging fruit do you yeah. typically find or want to go after? Yeah, yeah. I love, Trevor, that you're doing that sort of early assessment or audit, if you will, um, to try to find that those pains. Um, so the very first thing that I do, and I even put this into contracts before I get mm -hmm. started with anybody, is customer research. So I need access to your customers and or a target customer list right. to go out there and discover from them, from their own words, 
where they're getting value from the products. So what happens is I'm looking for aha moments from the customers and then I'm delivering aha moments, if you will, for, you know, CEOs and founders inside of, you know, the companies that I'm working with. So I, I and I'd love to, if, if you don't mind, just deep dive a little bit, because this is really important, fun stuff. OK, so I work um, with a company called Forget the Funnel, and this company has founded a framework called Customer Led Growth. And um, it's a very easy framework that takes you from, you know, how to systematically, structurally do customer research so that it feeds insights into growth strategies. Okay, so that 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 first month with a client is digging into all of the discovery and understanding from customers, okay, what triggered, what was going on in your life when you were looking for a new solution? When you found the solution, what convinced you to try them, right? When you were inside of the solution, um, you know, what, what happened that made you feel confident this is going to work for you? Now that you have the solution, how is your life different? How does this impacted your day to day? And so then we're making a story, right? From really from struggle to aha moments to life after for that customer. And you're doing it, I guess, I'm not going to say at a large, large scale, but to the scale that you can, whether it's 10 customers or hundred customer surveys, right? to build um, these patterns that you can go off and use then to build out the growth strategies. So every single time I do this, um, I, I come out with these like mind blowing, you know, insights for CEOs. And I'll give you an example of the latest one that I did was uh, for a company called Hiring Branch that I am now um, in house now with. I did 10 customer interviews with them, found out that the way the impact that their customers had from the from the tool actually was very, very different from what the tool had thought it was doing. So it's a tool that assesses candidates, okay? And they thought this was going to help, you know, these recruiters screen candidates. But in fact, when I was interviewing them, they told me, they're like, no, no, Beth, I actually stopped interviewing because the tool is that good. So I go back to the client and I'm like, hey, aha moment. This is how they're actually using your product. And then that informed all of our positioning strategy, go to market, you name it. So um, just want to highlight that. So that's the importance of doing customer research at the onset of any kind of customer engagement. And while I do that, every marketer can and should be doing that, right? I have a, um, I had to give a talk once where I explained that sometimes what we sell and what customers buy are not the same thing. And uh, the example I used was clear. Do you guys know what clear and in, in airport security, what clear is? No. Mm. Clear is like TSA expedited security line processing, except on steroids. And you pay a lot for it. And it's always located next. It's not in every airport, but it's in a lot of major airports. If you travel a lot, like I used to, uh, there'd be the TS, there'd be regular security. Like, you know, that's a nightmare. Then there's like the TSA line, which can be quite long, but is expedited. And then there's clear, which are these biometric scanners. They're always like staffed with a bunch of people. And you pay extra on top of that. Like you have to have, I'm pretty sure you have to have pre-check already, which is I think like a hundred bucks every five years. But then clear is like 150 something every year. And clear thinks that, because uh, of course, the only people who are going to pay for that are people who travel a lot, which tend to be business travelers. And uh, I was in sales at the time. Clear thinks that even today in their marketing, they think that they're selling faster security line processing. And that's not what anyone who buys clear buys. What, what I bought, what everyone that I knew who had clear bought was predictability, which is to say, we knew that we'd probably never spend more than 15 minutes in any airport line ever to get through security. Because they'll actually like cut you in front of the TSA pre-check people and you just go through uh, once you've been uh, you know, uh, authenticated with your fingerprints and stuff. And so, uh, and the reason you buy uh, something like that is, okay, I can stay at this customer site. I can do one more meeting before I need to get to the airport. Or I can definitely like invite this customer to lunch now or stay a little longer because I know roughly how long it's going to take to get through airport security in Atlanta or, you know, or DC or some crazy place. And so, like even today, like like I said, they think they're selling faster security line processing, but no one buys it for that. They buy it for the predictability of knowing they're probably not going to miss their flight if they try to squeeze in one more customer meeting in that city because it's probably only going to take 10 or 15 minutes to get through the security line. And uh, if anyone from Clear is watching, hey, that's what we're buying. 
So maybe like mark it to that instead. <laughs> um, okay, fair enough. So, okay, uh, other than like ahas, uh, Beth, and then we'll go to Trevor. Like what do clients normally not see or not know about until a fractional CMO starts working with them? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. So they often don't know how to build foundational and this is going to sound really boring, but foundational documentation to build up a marketing organization inside of the company. So, mm. so, you know, marketing isn't branding colors and fun taglines, right? So marketing is, it's, it's, it's research, it's competitive intelligence, it's building personas, it's, you know, road mapping, it's all of that fun stuff. And there's actually science that goes into that. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that is usually under underscored, I think, you know, from, uh, from uh, an executive team hiring me. Overlooked. Thank you. Overlooked. Okay. <laughs> and how about you, Trevor? What, what do you think clients normally don't know about or don't see until you start working with them? Yeah, I think very similarly, it's around the data. A lot of times, you know, I'll, I'll hear from the people that I work with that, well, we would do that, but we can't afford that. But there's not really anything that's backing up saying that they can't afford a certain thing because right. maybe they're burning money in another area where they just don't have the insights as to why that is or isn't working many cases, it's just, well, this is what we've always done. So we're going to keep doing it. So I think the advancement of technology has almost created a paralysis for, for founders. Mm. And even um, because being able to evolve through all the changes that are happening, it, it's overwhelming. Like there isn't a person on this planet that can keep up with it. It's, it's technology and robots that will be dictating <laughs> the future. Right. It's just that we get to guide it as humans with the emotional elements of understanding how humans make decisions. So a lot of times that's the biggest thing is just getting an understanding of why are the decisions being made? And typically they're not because of the data or, you know, it's always because of uh, fears and things that they're unfamiliar with to actually leap into, which could exponentially change their business. Right. Well, then let's talk about like not knowing what to do or like, even those fears. Uh, like what should a CEO understand about a fractional CMO to get the, like extract the last penny of value from them? Well, there was one thing that I wanted to mention earlier, actually, and maybe this mm -hmm. is an opportunity to do it is that I typically now, right now I've worked with B2C over the years as well, but I typically work with clients that are selling in a business to business environment. Yeah, me too. And in many, yeah, in many cases, um, those businesses don't make enough offers. And it's very similar to what you said, Beth, with regards to market research is like, how do you know what people actually want unless you make an offer to them and somebody puts their hand up and says yes, or they say an emphatic no, or they're somewhere in the middle. Ah, maybe I'm not sure, but not right now, because that insight alone could gather us a lot of info on what direction to go. But it also could get that 3% of the market that's ready to buy your thing if you would just make an offer in front of them. Right. And how about you, Beth? What do you think a CEO would need to understand about fractional CMOs to get maximum value? 100% uh, with you on the data piece. And uh, what it sounded like you were saying, Trevor, was also just iterative testing to, to put out those offers and just test offers and get some data and, and build and grow on those uh, results. Um, so uh, also, you, because we're fractional, so we're not with you. We're not available 40 hours a week, right? So it's using their structured time well. So I would, I would even recommend for these folks to uh, almost leverage CMOs as strategic advisors, right? So again, more than branding and taglines, um, but rather we're here to think about revenue. We're here to think about business models, pricing, markets, expansion, you name it, right. um, support to a sales function. And, and then it always, the, the CMO's role will change and evolve to the client's existing uh, management and resources they have. So for example, if there is not a strong sales leader in that leadership team, 
Well, the marketing person can assist with that. If there's not a strong product person in that team, marketing can also assist with product. So really, really ha having your fractional CMO have the encompassing that parachute view of everything, all the levers in the company from product to sales to price, um, leverage them for that. Okay, so let's expand on that a tiny bit, Beth, and then we'll go back to Trevor for it. What are like signs that a client should not have hired a fractional CMO or wasn't ready for one yet? Right. Okay, that's a good one. So often you'll see fractional CMO come into play when there's a marketing need mm -hmm. at a at a strategic level, but no real operators and or no you know full time employee budget. And fractional is always a good idea when starting out. Because often what I've seen over and over again is um, earlier stage startups who have funding, so they kind of have the money, but they don't have the maturity yet. And so they'll hire C-suites and within six months, those C-suites are gone. And that often is a symptom to a founder not being clear on their paths and not ready to let go, right? right. So when it doesn't, it doesn't work when there's micromanaging happening, um, I mean, there's also a fit there that has to, has to, has to happen, right? So the a founder has to be comfortable and trust, really, really trust that this is the right person to help build their strategy together, right? Nobody, nobody in that, in, in, in the team is, you know, going to be building, uh, you know, any kind of high level, whether it's OKRs or whatever that is in a silo. So it has to be the teamwork to, to, to get there. So I'd say micromanaging, not, not ready to really, um, not, not having that clear path. How about you, Trevor? What do you think? When, when, when should yeah, someone was... not hire a fractional or they're not ready for them? What, like, what do you see? When they're not ready for one, I think Beth was speaking to when, when they should hire a fractional. <laughs> and, and I would reiterate that too. Just the idea that when you hire a fractional, yes, typically if you're hiring a CMO, you're getting somebody with a core expertise in marketing. But any C-level executive and somebody with 10, 15, 20 years experience that's coming in, they've danced between departments. They've worked in sales. They've worked in operations. They've worked even indirectly with HR, for example, too. So that's one of the things that you get when you work with a fractional is you're not getting necessarily a specialist. You're getting more of a generalist with, with a chosen specialization in a certain right. area. And it is one of the areas that we find that a lot of companies break in uh, hiring a fractional is because, you know, like my wife actually has a rich history in, in recruiting as well. And that's evolved uh, immensely over the years. But if that founder CEO is not willing to trust and give up the reins to the C-level suite uh, team that they're hiring, who are very high paid, very talented, and should not be micromanaged, then it's just destined to implode. So the nice part about the fractional work is that you have the opportunity to kind of dance a little bit between all these things. And like in my case, my goal is to replace myself at some point so right. that I can evolve to the next level of conversation with that person, which at the end of the day, the personal conversation about how that person as an individual is evolving as a human. Because there's a saying that says um, there's no such thing as business problems. There's only personal problems that show up as business problems. So we should focus right. there. That's the foundation. <laughs> uh, okay. So I think we have like, I have one more question. Uh, so uh, Trevor, and then we'll go to Beth to finish up. Uh, it's a hypothetical scenario, right? Uh, basically in the C-suite, it's you and the CEO. And just like, you know, that's the, that's basically the leadership team at this point. And the CEO says, Hey, I want your help selecting or hiring or vetting a new head of sales. Mm. What are you looking for to make sure that that's a good fit? Oh, that's a great question because a lot of times my default answer would be, well, let's get clear on what the values, vision, mission mm -hmm. of this company is so that whoever you do hire comes in and operates with that level of integrity in alignment with you. But I would asterisk that with, some of the most effective salespeople that I've ever seen can easily come into an organization, not even really fully understand the full values, mission, and vision of a company and like just that. get the job done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've operated as that person before. There's some people that can do it very effectively. I find it like almost destined for burnout, right. but 
I think that's one of the first, you know, what are we trying to do here? Are we just trying to move the needle on the, on the P and L or are we trying to find somebody that will come in and be a part of this leadership team going forward and grow over the long term as opposed to the short term wins? And what about you, Beth? If you were uh, one of the two people that's involved in hiring a new head of sales, the first ever, let's say, head of sales, fractional or otherwise, yeah. Like, what are you looking for in that candidate? What are you asking them? Uh, that's a great question. Or what's a uh, I, I think the first thing I would be looking for is a roster. Uh, if they have an existing network inside of the industry you are looking to sell to, it's probably the fastest path to sales success if you're hiring a sales leader. Um, because it's either, you know, you have, you know, boiler room, SDRs, cold calling, or you have relationship building sales folks right. who already know which doors to knock, you know, sorry, doors to knock on and, you know, shake hands. Um, so that would be, that would be one. And then the second, uh, would be looking into the, just their previous success, not to say that they have to come from, you know, big you know, banner type of uh, pedigree companies, but rather that whatever they did do at their previous companies, they did have a sales impact. Um, I, you guys are the seventh and eighth guests on this podcast since we started recording it. And uh, so far, it's I, I threw this question in. It's it's not normally included. And I threw this question in in, the, in all of the last ones just to see. And it runs 50-50. So I keep an ear out for it. 50-50, half the time, people talk about what would make for a great head of sales. And half the time, they talk about uh, the, the importance of that new head of sales appreciating and knowing how to work with marketing. Neither one of you guys really mm -hmm. covered the work with marketing. I don't know. It's just a different way of looking at it, I guess. But it is a, I love this question. I think it's, I think it's going to become part of every one. Because, I mean, first of all, it's not often that the head of marketing gets to help pick the head of sales. Usually they're in place already or not even, you know, not part of the selection process regardless. And so it's, it's always interesting to see like who's looking at what would make the best head of sales for the company and, uh, and what would make the best head of sales for marketing. It is Look a how altruistic you guys are amazing. <laughs> Thanks Dean. It, it is a symbiotic relationship, isn't it? Oh yeah. I'm, I don't know about you, Trevor, but I've never worked with a salesperson who d didn't work well with marketing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, the first thing that comes to mind for me, too, is that there's just a different dynamic, too, when you have somebody that's internal working in their full time career and maybe feeling a little bit threatened if that salesperson doesn't jive with what they're trying to deliver to them or getting pushed back right. on the quality yeah. of leads and that type of thing. Whereas I don't know about you, Beth, but over the years, like I've started to just become, um, you know, rubber to, to any kind of criticism. I'm like, OK. Let's let's figure that out then. <laughs> I don't take it personally because I know that my career is not on the line. I can actually right. be agile in all situations. So it's another benefit of honestly being fractional for both me and the companies that I'm working with and the individuals, yeah. the visionaries. Well, guys, this has been really great. And thanks for like helping me out on this. Uh, Trevor, uh, tell people how to get how to find you if they want to find you. I'm sure they'll want to find you. Sure. Yeah, best way is just Google my name, Trevor Turnbull, and mm -hmm. you'll find me on LinkedIn. Um, everything's constantly evolving, just like this whole marketing world. So you'll see updates on my websites. And we have a website called Big Crazy Growth as well, which is where we talk about our fractional services. And then Beth, uh, two things for you. First, uh, tell people how to find you. And then second, what was that uh, company something without funnel or something that you'd mentioned earlier in case anyone wanted to look them up. We have like no relation to that company, but it sounds interesting. Yes, please. Uh, so forget the funnel. They have a book. The funnel. Uh, it's the easiest, most concise, engaging read um, that you'll have this year. It's, it's lovely. Forget the funnel. Okay. And how do people find you? Just in case. Oh, absolutely. On LinkedIn. I think I'm the only Beth two on LinkedIn, although I haven't checked. Cool. All right. Thanks, folks. And like, thanks, Beth. Thanks, Trevor. This has been great. And then uh, I guess we'll see everybody on the next episode. And now I have to click the button and we're out. I'm going to trim that part so that the audience isn't going to see that.